get a Jesus workout? Woo-hoo. Now listen, we can't talk about Jamaica without mentioning that we're going on a church cruise in 2020. Remember that? So guess what? The rooms are almost sold out, and it's a year away. We're going in February of 2020. So um, if you want to go, you need to call and at least put your deposit down before the boat sells out. Cruises sell out way ahead. So if you wait till three months before we go and say, I'm going, I'm going to be like, you're not. You're, you're going to wave goodbye to us, and we're going without you. So we are doing a five-day out of New Orleans, and um, we're going to minister a little bit in New Orleans, and we're going to go bless some countries in Mexico. So it'll be a fun time. We went three years ago, and we had a great time. So last week, well, two weeks ago, we started in Romans 12 with Embrace Your Place. That was Pastor Tom. And last week was Kevin Exploring Your Gifts from Romans 12. Anybody here for those? All right. Well, you can go back and listen to those in the archives on the website if you need to. But has anybody ever had a cracked windshield? Okay. Well, we've had that happen to our vans a couple of times, and it was like 100 bucks to fix it. It was like no big deal. So now we have a new church van. It's a 2016, a very nice Honda Odyssey new van. In this cold weather we had, guess what? The windshield cracked. They're like, well, a stone probably hit it. Something happened to it. I'm like, yeah, okay. So I call thinking it's going to be $100, maybe $300. Seven hundred and fifty dollars, seven forty-three to be exact. And I was like, "What is that?" And the guy said, "Well, you know how you have these sensors on the front of your car and the back of your car, and you have a little picture when you back. You can see all that. When you put your right turn signal on, I can see what it looks like outside." He said, "All of that is calibrated to your windshield." So he's right. Right now. When I turn that signal on, it looks blurry, it's in and out, it's, it's messy. Calibrated to the windshield. And the minute he said it, I thought, well, that's like Jesus. He's our windshield. Everything is calibrated to him. And we got to keep the windshield clean. And I'm telling you, that crack is over here, and it distracts me like crazy. Like the minute I realized it was there, I didn't even see it at first. And Seth from the back seat with Elijah and Amiri, I'm taking the boys somewhere. Hey, there's a crack in the window. It took them to tell me. And now all I see is the crack in the window. It's driving me a little woo-hoo. And uh, it's getting fixed on Monday. And so it was just a good reminder to me that we need to uh, seal up the cracks. Is there a crack that keeps us in distraction? Is the windshield clean? And first and foremost, is everything in our life calibrated to Jesus, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So those are just good, I mean, that's just how the, if you haven't figured it out, the Lord works with me in practical ways. And that's how he does with me. So there was a little story for you I thought was worth saying. Um, The Holy Spirit is our navigating system. And it's a gift from the Father and it's practicable and I say it practicable. I don't think that's a word. Do we think that's a word, all my English girls? It is now. Oh, I like, Brian says it is now. It's practical and applicable. Ah. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Romans 12. The two pastors before me did a fabulous job with it. But if you're trying to figure out where you go or how do you fit, your mind will immediately think, what do I need to do? And now remember, we don't want to fall into works. We live in grace. There's nothing you're going to do that's going to get you farther ahead with Jesus. Like, or anything you're going to do bad that's going to get you put to the end. It's not, it's not happening. That's not grace. But when you live from a Holy Spirit perspective with our eyes on Jesus, then we are inspired to do things for the kingdom. So let's not do nothing because we're afraid we might be in works or religious, right? It's all a perspective of mind and heart. Where is your heart set? Listen, all living things live from the heart. Do you hear me? All living things live from the heart. Even things that don't have a heartbeat have a nucleus. They still have a core to them, right? 
if we go back to science way, way back. So I want to take you back to Romans 12. And what I did is I, I went, okay, Father, what do I want to see here without having to do this huge word study of everything? And what I did is I went, to ver- I went right through Romans 12, and I went to verse 1, and this is what stuck out. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So don't come and whine and complain to me or complain to Jesus, which really you should complain up. Just complain up. Your spouse will be much happier. Your life will be more peaceful. Your friends will have a break from all the phone calls. And you'll eventually be in the right place to start with. But offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Well, if you want to know what your gifting is, are you doing that first? Is that in your heart to say, okay, I'm going to offer all I am to you, Lord. It's all there for you, and I'm not going to do the decision making. Then look at verse 2. This is what jumped out. Do not conform to the world. Do not conform to the world. So you just do little Holy Spirit checks. You don't get in condemnation and feel like you're under religion. Like, aren't you happy the Holy Spirit shows you what to do? Like, I like direction. I'd rather look in the Word and see that and have the Word and the Holy Spirit be my GPS than having to call and get everybody else's good idea or opinion. Does that make sense? I'm like, what is that? It's a plane. It's a bird. And then in verse 3, it just goes right through. I was so tickled when I saw this. 3, it says, transformed by renewing. That will be transformed by renewing. Renewing what? Our mind. And when you renew your mind, when you change the way you think about something, then your mouth should come into alignment. The way you act should come into alignment. You're out of the heart. The mouth speaks. That's what it says, right? Miss Ann Hucky's here. Hey, Miss Ann. Verse, where did I go next? Four. In four, I wrote, do not think of yourself too highly. Do not think of yourself too highly. And that's just something for all of us because, you know, when you find something that you're gifting and you're actually, you're good at it. And if you like it, you'll get good at it. Then you can start thinking, you know what, I'm really good at this. I met someone on a, uh, the other week, and I was talking to them on the phone, and they said, well, you know what, I don't really want to quit this job that's driving me crazy and takes up, you know, 80 hours of my life and all this kind of stuff because I'm the only one that can do it this good. And I said, well, that may be true, but all the stuff you would want to do with God that you're telling me about, I don't think that's going to happen unless you get in some humility to say, okay, God, you, it, I'm just going to give it over to you. You can fix it and make it better. But they're in this real confusion right now, feeling torn of, I need to stay here because I'm the best for this job, but I, I want to do these things with God. There's some pride in there somewhere. Like, that's not the whole surrender all. So I had to be real nice about it and try to, how do we say this, Lord? And hopefully he'll meditate on it. But don't we all have those areas, you know, that you just don't want to give it up? Because it's, once you get good at something, then it's, it's not so hard and challenging. But the next thing that'll come is, I'm bored. Oh, Lord, every time I say I, or think I'm bored, I feel like the Holy Spirit goes, hum, hum, <laughs> like, okay, I, I want to settle down. All right, and verse 5, what did I want to see in 5? Oh, I just wrote it as point 5, where he talks about different gifts. It says that I give different gifts. So what we want to find out is what the Holy Spirit and ourselves want to be doing because it says he wants you to be happy he wants you to have the desires of your heart so what do we want to do but we are not going to be afraid that somebody else has something else we can't I'll tell you this it's like we talked about our little gal visiting that when you have a gift it'll rub off on other people if you want to kill giants then you go run with people that do that this church excels in love People say to me, somebody said this the other week, well, how do you guys fund what you do? You know, I visited your church, and there's like 60 people there. And I'm, yeah, but we have like, you know, four or five full-time pastors. We're all over. We travel all over. We've got all these wonderful people that live stream from near and far. And so people so into us, but I believe it's because we love people well. And we preach good Bible and Jesus and all these things that follow. But this right here, this group of people, 
here in Tip City, Ohio, funds everything we do because you fund the love. Do you hear me? So do the folks on the outside near and wide, but it didn't start with them. It started with this place right here. It started with my father-in-law and mother-in-law. There, there's my mother-in-law right there, Miss Mary Lou, wave her hand. 20-something years ago, build a house next door. Craig's wonderful wife, who we miss dearly, who uh, you know, is awaiting the return of Jesus, in the basement how, 20 years ago, she's got a card table, and Pastor John's got a card table and a phone between them, and concrete walls, and Mary Lou's upstairs cooking lunch, and that's how it started. And they just took phone calls and loved people well and went out traveling. People would call, say, we're hurt. Our church has abused us. People have treated us terrible. We just want to see the power of God. We're tired of just hearing all these boring Bible teachings and nothing is happening. And I saw a video from 20 years ago of the first meeting they did, and John said, we are a healing and deliverance ministry. So if you read Luke 4 in the Bible and you don't like anything like that, heal the brokenhearted, set the captives free, getting healed from fevers and demons and all that, that's what we deal in here, folks. And it's all uh, catapulted from love. And that's, don't ever doubt, if you don't think you have a gifting, your gifting is, to, is for all of us to come together in love because it's what grows everything. It grows everything. And it's hard to be a lover of people if you can't surrender yourself. You know, you can't wait till you got all your problems taken care of and then we're gonna do a thing. But that's why you need everybody in the body of Christ because when you feel like crap, you can call somebody or get around somebody and all of a sudden you're inspired. You feel like, you know what, I'm part of a thing together. This whole I can make it with, with just me and God, yeah, Jesus did. But he still gave him 12. He still gave him mighty men. You know, I, we have a lot of property here. This, this church could have huge buildings all over. We've had prophetic vision for that. But I love our little group. I, you know what I'm saying? And we pack this house out for events, but I just love the closeness. We get folks that visit us from big churches, and, you know, I'm like, God, I know you've given us vision and you've showed us stuff, but it almost scares me. Because when people get into these, they'll talk to me, different pastors and different people that'll come here. Well, I just feel like I'm obsolete. I feel like no one sees me anymore. I feel like I'm in a social club. I'm like, you know what? Ask, but ask God why you're there. What, what are you doing there? And when that all happens for us, we'll make it. We're going to be okay. I'm like, all right, Lord, this, this will be okay. You know how he just kind of works you into things smoothly? We'll appreciate that. So if you ever doubt... Your love is what funds this place, right here. Of course, we appreciate your offerings, too. My father-in-law used to say, you send it and we'll spend it. That does happen. Oh, my gosh. All right, I got on a little bunny trail there. All right, so he said to me, and the Holy Spirit was very clear, I was reading. So when I hit verse 9 through 21, he said, if you live from these perspectives, your gifting will be revealed. If you live from these perspectives, your gifting will be revealed. And I think he said the word perspectives very purposely so you wouldn't feel like you had a checklist of rules. But these are things that Jesus calibrates to. Does that make sense? His settings are true to the word. You know, he was spirit-led, but he was also uh, Bible-fed from the scrolls. He could stand up and preach and, you know, I don't know what age is it they have to, re they have to literally recite the book of Leviticus. Those, uh, yeah, is it six? It's little. Could you imagine that? We're just trying to read over at my house in the first grade. I'm like, we're going to stand up and recite the book of Leviticus. Thank you, Lord. We don't have to do that. But just, I'll read just a few of these. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. That is what he starts with. Be devoted to one another in love. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. These are things we calibrate to. Live in harmony with one another. So when you read through all those, which you can because we've been reading them for the last couple weeks, it launches giftings. That's where we want to come back and have our perspective to. And you know what I've found with the word? Because of the Holy Spirit, you can be instantaneous in things. We are struggling way too much. You read through here and say, well, okay, I've got five of these that I think I'm just terrible at. I need a deliverance ministry. 
I've got to get in there and get some prayer and get some help. I'm to the point now with the Holy Spirit that the minute I read it, I expect it. Instantly, I know I've changed. We can be that way. The Holy Spirit can do something in you like that because it's a mind thing. The, the rest of it will follow. Get your heart and mind right. You don't need a prayer every darn time with somebody. Really. You don't need to come sit. And I mean, that makes me feel good in you too. Let's have an encouraging word and all these other things. But you can read that and say, I'm recalibrated. If the world can calibrate, I, when they called me, we're going to come and do this windshield in your driveway. I said, really? Yes, we have special equipment. I said, well, how long is this going to take? Oh, 15 minutes max for the calibration. We set it all up and we press a button, but then we have to drive it to make sure it's set. I thought, well, there's my life right there. You know, why can't the Holy Spirit, we read the word, my spirit connects with the Holy Spirit, bang, the calibration is done. Now I drive myself. Let's drive this thing and see what happens. And I'll settle in, you know. It's our car, this new one too. The minute the tires, it kept getting cold and hot outside. And then the tires were weird. And I could feel, I felt like, oh, maybe I have a flat tire. Like, you know, it was off. And the minute it warmed up outside, it reset itself. Well, come warm yourself up with Jesus if your tires are a little, you know, you feel like you got a flat tire and you're driving down the road and need an alignment. I don't know where this whole car thing came from this week. But I want you to hear that about read the word, bang. My heart has changed. My mind is set. My actions and my mouth will follow. I'm good to go. Let's get on the road. You know, I always think that when I'm flying, they're like, okay, you know they're doing all the checks of the plane. They have a checklist they have to go through. But those pilots, they've done it so many times. They're so skilled. It can happen fast. It can move fast. And then when people come alongside of us, they're like, la, 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 la. You're like, yeah, come on, I'll teach you something different. They'll watch you do it, and it'll be like, oh. So if you struggle in an area, you can't seem to get the calibration, you're stuck, you're embarrassed, you don't want to tell anybody. A perfect example is finances for people. For years, our finances were a mess when we were first married. And we didn't want to tell anybody because we were embarrassed. We didn't want to tell anybody that we put so much debt on credit cards because every time our car broke, we didn't have any savings to fix it. And then all of a sudden, we had a lot of money on credit cards, and then we had a baby and had to pay some of that. And there were all a lot of excuses, but all that did was keep us real quiet. And then we started feeling embarrassed and guilty and you know you don't want to ask for help and if you go to people that love you well they'll give you some great direction my brother-in-law was one of those people he did our taxes and he's like what's going on with this because we were so excited to get a tax return to pay off all our stuff and we're telling him this and he's like you know that's really not the way it should go you know you need like a, a savings for an emergency you know he told us things that he calibrates his life to that helped us but if I'm going to be embarrassed and, and, you know, can't get help or ask, it gets a little tough. Um, do we have water up here? We do. All right, so one of the things it says in the first part of Romans 12, mm, can you pull it up like verse 1? Well, listen, it, let me just, I don't want to read it all to you. It talks about in the beginning of Romans 12 where it says, um, that some excel in teaching, some excel in prophesy, and, and encouragement. It lists all these different things that he calls giftings that different people have and can excel in, right? And as I'm reading through that, the Lord said, everyone has a gifting in prophecy if they want it. If they want it. I had to call Ellen and Tom in the back room today and said, do you think this is is, you know, conflicting with him saying certain people get certain things according to the faith, da-da-da-da-da, they've been given? No, no, we had to talk about it. Because it was clear as a bell. Everyone can have a gifting in prophecy if you want to pursue it, if you want to go after it. It is really, really, really important. And Paul talks about it. Oh, the Lord said that. Paul knows. I thought, what do you mean Paul knows? And then I remembered that verse where he said, I would that you all prophesy. Now, what do you think about Paul? He was killing Christians. Do you think he was like real excelling at prophecy then? I don't think so, except prophesying death to people. 
And then he began to excel in all kinds of gifts in the church. He chose to pursue and go after them. He chose that. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, earnestly pursue love. Hey, we got that down. And eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. And you know what? Don't let anybody tell you you just need to wait around till God points his finger at you. People be like, well, I don't think that's right. You're pursuing something. Okay, well, you just ask the Lord. Just smile and say, okay. Just because people say it doesn't mean it's true. Just because I say stuff up here. If the Lord told me, I don't care what I told you, he said. You go ask him, is she, is that, what does that mean to me? Go in the scriptures and read it and ask him what it means to you. Just because somebody says it doesn't mean it's true. Except I believe the word is true. I believe it's a good guidebook for the life book. 1 Corinthians 14, 5 in the ESV says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. In 1 Corinthians 14, 2, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries in the spirit. But he would, who prophesies speaks to men for their edification, encouragement, and comfort. The one who speaks in tongues edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. So scripturally, it's there that we should press in for those things. He said, I need more Pauls. I need more Pauls. I love that contrast with grace, with law and grace. What is more contrasting? I need more Pauls. I need more people that think they're murderers and killers and they're terrible people. You know, and most of us, all we did was fight with our spouse or something and we think we're going to hell. You know, it's not like we even killed anybody. You know, I, I, I smacked my kid in public and I might be put in jail. I don't know. There's lots of things that we just condemn ourselves for. But what a contrast from law to grace. I need more Pauls. I need, think of that, from that to this. Why can't we say, yes, I'll have some of that. You know, he said, he's pressing to prophecy, but not just to preach for glory. See, everybody wants to preach from a stage. Everybody wants to preach from a stage. They want all the decorative filigreed jobs, which really aren't what you think they are. <laughs> but there's no glory in that without him. You got to press into the things that he's wanting us to do at the right time. And have you ever seen that? People pursue something from the kingdom, but their timing was totally off, and it was a disaster. And they're trying to tell you how they should be doing all this stuff, and the answer is, you know what? I don't doubt that God has showed you that. But is this the time? Was that the place? Was that the person? Like, the Holy Spirit has breaks, let me tell you. He likes to see how well your mouth is trained before he looses you. And the other thing I wanted to talk to you about with prophecy, um, I think we struggle with prophecy in our church body and in the prophetic because we spent years being trained that prophecy had to be decent in order and that somebody else decided what that was. It does have some guidelines in the word about two of it most by three for speaking in tongues and I would that you all prophesy. But I grew up and my whole world of speaking in tongues, interpretation, prophecy was all in the context of a meeting. It was all in a, in a Bible study or a church meeting and somebody called on me. Or they said, stand up if you want to. So the whole idea that I would prophesy something to a person on a street without a group of people, you know what I mean? Does that make sense to any of you? It felt like I was out of order. It felt like I was doing something wrong. That the Lord might say, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I got lots of stories I could tell you. Listen, if you're led by the Holy Spirit, he tells you. I've had him say, speak in tongues in front of somebody to them when they were asking me about it. What is this? I don't understand. Can you do it for me? And I'm like, okay. Well, in my head I know it's a sign to the unbelievers, but I know that it says we just shouldn't do that just to be doing it randomly. And people are like, what are you doing? But the Lord said, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I took me, like the person was looking at me like, well, I thought you could do a thing. But once I got permission from the Holy Spirit, I did that for them. I spoke in tongues, your heavenly language. And they're like, well, I'd like to do that. 
I've been going to church for years and I've heard about this and you seem normal and not some crazy demonic woman. <laughs> you know, because people hear stuff. And, well, I would like to do that too. I mean, literally, I, you know, should I say, I, I think I can say this. But I, I got to spend some time, I met somebody in Washington. And I didn't know them. They came to a table that we were sitting at, Ellen and Mom and Elroy and I. And I was immediately in the spirit attracted to this person. The Lord started talking to me about this person. And um, Elroy was very excited because he wanted to have a meeting with that person. And because they work in the White House, he couldn't get them. He's like, I can't get this person. And he got to see him when he walked in the restaurant. And they got a little chat. And he got to get his question answered. And so he came by our table, this gentleman, to say goodbye to us. And Elroy looks at me, and he tells this gentleman, she's a pastor. I want her to pray for you. And the guy looks at me, and the first thing I said is, well, you know what? He's a pastor, too. He's holding out on you. I said, he's, he came to preach at our church camp, and, and, all, and, the, and the guy goes, yeah, I know. He lives his, his Jesus out loud. He lives it all out there. And I said, well, good. So Elroy's like, yeah, she's going to pray for you. And I say, I say, no, I'm not going to pray. And I'm thinking, and Elroy looks at me like, what do you mean you're not going to pray? I said, I said, can I touch you? And he looked at me, and, I, and he said, well, sure. And I touched his hand, and I just had a download in the spirit. Like I just, I knew all this stuff just came into me. And I said, I'm just going to speak to you. And I started to speak. And I, clo- I started, and I closed my eyes and just said all this stuff to him. I mean, it probably went three minutes, four minutes, whatever. I was like, oh, wow. We, it stops, and I said, does that mean anything to you? Like, is that even, what is that? You know, I knew it was from the Lord. He said, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Ellen says, hey, I taped it. I'm like, she's sitting behind me. I'm like, you did? She's, he's like, yeah. I said, okay, would you like that? He goes, sure. Exchanges, phone numbers, all this other stuff. And so she sent it to him. And when I got home, I texted and I said, hey, did you happen to get that prophecy from Miss Ellen? And he said, I did. Yes, thank you. And then he said, he texted, can I call you later? Sure. And um, just a neat gentleman. I'm praying he gets to come preach here someday. I believe he's totally called into ministry. Absolutely. And uh, he talked to me a little bit about his background. His mom, he's a Baptist background, and his mom and dad are ministers. And he said, you know what? I've been speaking in tongues my whole life, but I don't uh, understand the, the interpretation and the pro- prophecy and how that, you know, I've been in meetings, he said, where everybody else does it, but I haven't. And I'd, I think I can. I'd like to. I was just so tickled. And we just had a great talk about it, and I sent him growing in God's power. So, you know, I don't know if I'll ever get to talk to him again. I don't know if I'll ever see him again. But he's pressing in. I mean, he works in one of the most prestigious jobs in the world. But God's got him on things of the Spirit. And I'm excited for him. I'm like, and I'm like, well, I thought we came to Washington to see uh, D.C. in the snow. We were taking Ellen, my mom, and I for a little tour of Washington after we went to do an ordination for Gervais Crouch. You just never know. But that all happened because of prophecy of prophetic speaking. So I just loose all of us in the name of Jesus from any meeting we've ever been in, (laughs) from any idea that we need to wait for someone to give us permission. I just give us all Holy Spirit permission to do whatever Jesus says, whatever the Father leads. What about the angels come and tell you something? Are we going to do that? Really? I mean, I just, I just, do you find yourself waiting around and you're thinking, what do I need? Permission. For somebody to tell us how it should go. So press in for prophecy like Paul. Press in for... for, pet, for, for <laughs> Peter Piper picked a... <laughs> how do you say that one? Press in for prophecy and prophetic things. There it is. Yeah? I mean, that word prophetic used to scare us, didn't it? People say, what does that mean? I'm like, here it is in a nutshell. Do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Beep, end right there. If an angel, if Jesus, Holy Spirit, whatever, just do it. Just go for it. Take the shot. 
take the three-point shot. You know, he gives 10-point shots. It's a lot easier with him. Oh, my gosh. Um, what do I want to say about this? <laughs> I've found this. People want Jesus. They're all, they like Jesus. They're, they're drawn to that. They like prophecy. They like prophetic things. Everywhere. I mean, I do too. I love to go to a meeting and somebody has a word for me. Or if somebody's ministering to you and they've got more to say. And we're all about healing too. You know, I heard somebody say, who was it? It was just yesterday. I don't know who said it. I can't even remember. And, oh, it was Francis Hunter said, oh, well, nobody cares. Uh, if you're an atheist, you don't care about anything. You don't believe in God and you don't care about any of this until you need healing. And then when you need anything, all of a sudden you become a believer. All of a sudden now you're changed. Jesus, prophetic, and healing. There's lots of other things in the spirit, but people love it. Everybody needs encouragement. Everybody needs Jesus, and everybody needs a healing of something, right? And I'm talking to the Lord about that, and he said, it's all in family. It's all in family. Because I hear from a lot of people, hey, what are you doing? I'm doing this. I'm teaching this. They tell me things that are going on with them, and I love it because it sparks me, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to go off into your thing. And I'm talking to him, and he said, listen, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? And I remembered back to the prophecy with John and Wayne and I, and Gabriel showed up, and it was, this is one of the things that was said. John had the prophecy of families continue in that. One time somebody wanted to change the name of Christian Family Fellowship about four years ago. Oh, the Holy Spirit like stood up and did cartwheels like that was a no. I absolutely believe that the Holy Spirit gave John Schroer the name we carry, Christian Family Fellowship. We're getting ready to do the interior of the sanctuary over. All the curtains are going. My kids will be so happy. They're like, Mom, get rid of the lights, get rid of the curtains, get some new carpet. It was good 20 years ago. And one of the things is we have a door back here. We're going to have a do doors that open so we can still access. It's going to have a more fixer uppery feel, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but somebody said, you know what? You need a big sign, like in black, somewhere that says family. Because that is who you guys are, right? It's in your name. Family is foundational to the kingdom. That's why the love is so key. So I'm telling Tom about this last week. We're talking, and I said, I just, I got to stay on focus. We got to stay on focus for family. And all these other things feed out of that prophetic and prophecy and healing. Because, you know, there's certain churches, they just do certain things, and that's, that's what God's called them to do. But I think we're, div we're diverse here. Family is foundational, and then we have a diversity to it. He said, I want to give you something. He brought me this yesterday. He heard Bill Johnson say this statement, and I love Bill. And he wrote it by hand, didn't you, for me. We sometimes judge things from a Wall Street mentality. We run them through our filters, which aren't always kingdom filters. Through church filters, religious filters, humanities filters, political filters, God's filter is kingdom. It's a family. Our Father, for thine is the kingdom. All kingdom issues are family issues. And once we leave the concept of family, we've left the subject of the kingdom. Boy, can that man preach a word. Uh, preach a word. That is something right there. So, um, wow. We're all called to be in the family. And family is foundational. So... John 5, 23, we'll close with a few of these. That So that everyone will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. And destruction of the family is the goal of all religious spirits. All spirits, they want to destroy family. And we can see it. I don't care what your family looks like now or ever look like. You have a spiritual family, and God can give you all things, and he can restore all things. He can make all things new, literally. And you say, but, you know, my dad died, and I never had that relationship restored. Or, you know, there's all these stories we hear. Or I was adopted, and I met my family five minutes, and then they died. You know, they're really tragic things. But look at Job's life. We can see in the scriptures what God does is he works with your mind and emotions and the Holy Spirit heals you. 
And then you don't have that sting of emotion where there's longing and loss. Jesus will come and stroke your hair. I mean, Ellen's got some stories and testimonies that maybe she'll share when she teaches next week about what Jesus has done for her in the time of losing someone. When we have whatever that is that's lost to you. Some of the hardest things for women to deal with is when all their kids are out of the home. Now the kids are all gone, and I get calls from the husbands like, what should I do? It's like somebody died over here. You know, I need my wife back. But, you know, these things we go through. And the Holy Spirit, I don't understand it all. But he can take care of it all. And Jesus had the Holy Spirit, right? He worked with the Holy Spirit, moved that way. We're connected. We're all connected. We're not being dropped off on the ditch somewhere and, and too bad for something. But it takes acknowledging Jesus. 1 John 2, 23, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. And whoever confesses the Son has the Father as well. So my encouragement is that we would, we would acknowledge Jesus. And we would move from a family perspective, a foundation of family, and its, its catalyst is love. And then there's things that propel it forward. So a catalyst lights the flame, right? Love lights the flame. Jesus and family is foundation. Love lights the flame, right? But then you have to have a propulsion, something that propels you forward. Like you've ever been on an uh, aircraft carrier, which I've seen some of those, how they launch those fighter jets. It's, a propo- it's, it's, very, it's very intense. All the things that the kingdom has to offer launches us. Prophecy, teaching, encouragement, healing, all those things put that fighter out into the air off those big carriers. And I don't care if we're at sea. It doesn't matter where we are. We're called to a family, and that is who we are here. So I'm very thankful for all of you. I can do what I do because I feel well-loved. I hope you do too. And um, yeah. So before we close, I'm going to pray. And I want to let you know also that yesterday we had um, six hours of Charles and Francis Hunter. Great folks. They're gone now. They're sleeping in Jesus. But um, great stuff about healing and ministry, backs, just anything. So today when we get done, if any of you were there this weekend, there were about 20 of us, I'd like you to just kind of Stand up here and along the walls in pairs. Just pair up with whoever was here. If any of you need some prayer ministry, healing, you know, you got a twitch in your back. Oh, we had so many backs and knees healed last night, yesterday, and anything. Something weighing you, burdening you, just have somebody uh, pray with you. And, you know, have you ever felt where, I don't know what I need. I don't know, I just feel like it's February, it's cold, I'm a... I, my wife thinks I should clean the garage, you know, I just can't deal with anything. You know, you just need a God shot, right, Mike and Judy from the Holy Spirit, and have, you know, let them, I just say to people, let's just pray and see what God says. And, and you know, you start to pray, and you just have to say what he's saying. Does that work? So let, let's pray together for a minute. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we come before you and the Lord Jesus. We come into the throne room, the kingdom throne room. And we're going to take a lesson from the angels that worship at the throne day and night. And they're not trying to divide somebody off and asunder. They are there in, in praise and in worship at the throne. And Father, we come and we prostrate ourselves and we fall before you in the Lord Jesus. And we give you honor and glory and praise and surrender all. And we just know that your favor falls on us. And it comes out of us in an overflow. And just give us a settling, a settling of peacefulness that we are in a family. No matter what our earthly families look like or what our laundry room looks like, we're called to be with you, to be with the Lord Jesus, to be with the Holy Spirit, to move in peace. So we we just minister that settling and that love and kindness. And Father, out of that, we know comes direction the whisper, the picture, the vision, and just give us a passion to help people, to be compassionate. And out of that will come prophetic 
speaking from you, from the Spirit, revelatory things for each of us. Father, that we would not be afraid and not be shy, and we will just open our mouths, extend our hands, and minister whatever you would have us do to all the people we know and love and the people we've never even met before. We thank you for divine connections and interactions and all the weight and the burdens and the problems and the things we have no answers for or money to pay for. Lord, we just turn it over to you and we thank you in the Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ,